I'm uh, Robert W. Holmberg, H-O-L-M-B-E-R-G, Bob Holmberg. And uh, I like to tell people I've never had an honest job. I've worked for the uh, Manhattan Project or its predecessors all my life. I'm an Iowan by birth, Fort Dodge, Iowa. As a little boy, I was interested in chemistry. I went to college and uh, got my degree at Ames, Ames, Iowa, Iowa State College then. It's Iowa State University now. Got on the project rather indirectly. Um, there was a big time operator that came down from a place we had never heard of called the Metallurgical Laboratories of the University of Chicago that um, interviewed a group of, this was wartime in 40, 43 that this interview occurred and uh, couldn't tell us what they were doing, but it had to do with energy and it was going to revolutionize the world. Um, wasn't hard to put two and two together. I mean, we talk a lot about security, but in both Collier's Magazine and the Saturday Evening Post and many other places, there had been articles on fission. So I said, oh, that sounds like a fun job to have and I put in my application. Um, of course I used professors as my uh, references and by and by one of them came by to me and said, uh, well Bob we're doing the same thing here, why don't you come to work for us? Well that was better than going off to the wilds of Chicago so I did and uh, uh, got offered a job there. I was still in school though, so I decided to learn a little bit about atomic energy or radioactivity and things, and I would go to the library and uh, there weren't a lot of references. There are a few books there, and uh, every time I found one in the card catalog and asked for the book, I found that it was in the bindery. Of course, that, <laughs> that reinforced my belief. I, be I basically became a spy. <laughs> and uh, didn't know a lot of the technology of what was going on, but I knew what was going on. And so that's how I got started. I worked for Aunt Ames for just a short time as a civilian. I was just 21 years old, and uh, uh, they couldn't, couldn't uh, defer me any longer. And they said, Bob, we're going to draft you, and, but you'll be back here within a month. And, that was a little frightening because they were drafting people for, for everything at that time. And um, I remember standing on my tiptoes. I'm rather tall, but I stood on my tiptoes when they measured me, so I would be over uh, six foot five, or uh, where they would uh, couldn't take me to the navy. And uh, it was finally, I guess it was in Leavenworth, Kansas, where they got my uniform and uh, was waiting around and uh, they finally started yelling for me that you're shipping out and uh, there I saw on my papers for the first time that I was going to Louisiana but attached unassigned to the Manhattan District Corps of Engineers and so I knew they had found me. I had a very rugged uh, four days of basic training in Louisiana the captain didn't like me. I forgot to salute him, and uh, uh, I kept asking him when I was going to get orders to ship out. And finally, uh, finally, his orders came. And it bothered them a little because they they sent me just alone uh, on the nicest train trip I've ever taken to, from uh, Louisiana to to Chicago, where I. Um, and I left there on Thanksgiving Day, and what they didn't like about it, it said, you're not going anywhere, you're just going to Chicago and call a phone number. <laughs> and I said, that's okay. <laughs> and so they, they washed their hands of me. And, but uh, traveling alone, I, I remember, this was in wartime, the trains were crowded, but uh, I had first class tickets, I had a lower berth, all the way to St. Louis. And then the, the crowning thing was this um, chair car. 
uh, from, uh, this was daytime, from St. Louis to Chicago. Chair car had enormous picture windows and swivel chair. And I sat there and looked and uh, down at the other end of the car, there was an old bitty of a woman, probably 35 years old. And, <laughs> and uh, she and I shared this chair car. And I got up once to look into the next car, and they were hanging from the rafters, GIs and people, and things like that. I thought it was very important. All right, I got to Chicago, and uh, ha the reason I had to go through Chicago and couldn't go back to Ames is I had to... A wire home for my mother to send me civilian clothes. And so eventually these clothes came and uh, I took a train to Ames and I went back and uh, started working again on the project, but I was a uh, private in the Army at that time. Quite a reduction in pay, but uh, <laughs> it was better being a private <laughs> in a laboratory than a private in the uh, in a war zone where everybody was going at that time. Um, make a long story short, I worked there for a short time. Uh, there was some sort of cutback of personnel and they re-enlisted us into the, the regular army and they sent us to Oak Ridge. And so I came to Oak Ridge and uh, at that time I was assigned to the um, work in the uh, ca uh, castle on the hill. This is the, uh, the place that is now the DOE headquarters. And I got in a division, it was a research division. And, uh, we took care of all of the paperwork and technical papers of all of the project. And uh, it was in what we call God's wing of the, of the uh, castle on the hill, it was a wing. Uh, this was the wing where Colonel Nichols had his offices. We were down the hall away from them. Uh, it was the wing where Groves came bumbling in with great... <laughs> uh, uh, you know, we always laughed at him. He was a little overweight and he was overbearing too, So, uh, but uh, only laughed behind his back. <laughs> and uh, um, Eventually one of my... Um, Supervisors there got a job. His name was Jerry Coe, and he became a division director of the chemistry division of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It was Clinton Labs then. And uh, I told Jerry I needed a job so I could get out of the Army. I needed a job in a, uh, a defense related job so I could get in the Army, and he offered me a job. I remember this was, a, I got there, I got it to work just after the test bomb had been dropped and just a little bit before uh, they dropped the bombs on uh, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So uh, it, was, it was kind of a heady time. And after that, it was very quick, the war ended and uh, all of the people, top people taking new jobs, and I ended up really without any supervision. Uh, <laughs> and uh, finally got a job at, at the lab. I was a very young chemist and started out at the lab as a, as a with a BS. But they, in, the, in those days, uh, they probably wouldn't hire me as a technician nowadays, but in those days they hired me as a research chemist. I started out working in plutonium chemistry, of all things. I've always said that plutonium chemistry is a, plutonium is a nice safe element to work with because you can always, uh, you can always detect it on your hands by counters and things like that. It doesn't sneak up on you. Well, I've been there all my, all my life. Oh, I've forgotten, of course, um, one of my army experiences, I was uh, spending the afternoon in the PX one day and a buddy of mine came and said, I got a date for you. Well, I didn't really want a date, <laughs> but and I wasn't very well dressed. <laughs> Probably had a little too much beer. And 
but he dragged me off and we got in this car and that's where I met Reba. It wasn't a very good experience because it was kind of dark. Reba and some friend, a friend of hers, had just come back from a wedding and so they were overdressed and I <laughs> was underdressed and I wasn't quite sure which one of them was my date and so but uh, that began a, a long romance that uh, we have finally ended up in getting married we've had four children and ten grandchildren and we've lived in Oak Ridge all the time um, I can't. You can just sit down. Okay. You can talk you forgot to say that while we were raising those kids, you went on to get the Oh, yeah. I forgot that, too. Yeah. There was some contention in our family. Um, became, it became apparent you know, the lab that with a bachelor's degree, I couldn't pursue science, <laughs> the science at the level I wanted to without an advanced degree. So. I'd started taking courses from the University of Tennessee and uh, over many years I really very, took very little time off work and actually did my thesis work at the lab. So I finally got my PhD in physical chemistry, uh, well, I guess in well, 1960 I think it was. And, uh, um, since you were right down the hall to uh, Colonel Nichols, can you tell us a little bit about him? I did. I hardly knew the man. He was, you know, he was. Can you refer to the person? Because they won't hear my question. I, I hardly knew Colonel Nichols. Uh, he was behind a barricaded door. I, I, we were at the head of the stairs there, and we knew him. We saw him walk in. He looked like a fairly. He was fairly young in those days. By that, probably 30, 40, 40 or fifty, and a uh, uh, very busy man. So we didn't know him. We knew when Groves came because uh, our office doors were open, we could see him, and the secretaries and everybody would talk. I uh, actually have a, kind of, I have a memento of um, General Groves. Um, when the first publication uh, of the uh, re release of information, of scientific information about the project was the uh, so-called Smythe Report, and of course I was working in the research division there. I got one, and uh, got Leslie Groves to autograph it, and I still have that, so I'm kind of proud of that. Can you um, describe again what he, what the the common folks' impression was of Groves? They said General Groves. Of well, we thought we, we, you know, he he was he was overweight. He was always overweight, and he was uh, he was a general, and he would, you know, expected doors to open for him. And I remember once he bumbled into our building, and they they had a little a little uh, swinging swinging gate where a secretary would buzz you in, and he bumped into that, and you know things like that, and. Uh, we thought uh, we had kind of a negative attitude about him that he was kind of bumbling. Uh, I think this was entirely wrong. I think he was actually a very good administrator, but he was a general and expected to be treated like one. We all know, <laughs> basically civilians didn't always do this properly. Even though I was in the army, I never considered myself, you know, army. It was we were in, we we were in an outfit called the SCD, the Special Engineer Detachment, and it was a a group, oh, roughly a thousand in Oak Ridge. Um, I was in it in Ames too. Uh, of scientists and engineers, young ones, that w were drafted and sent to Oak Ridge or the other plants uh, somewhere. And they worked in the labs, and uh, uh, but they were uh, army, army, army people. So. That's great. Are there any... Um <laughs> yeah. 
Um, let's see. Uh, where, what else can you tell us about life in the Manhattan Project? Where you live? Did you live in a barracks? Um, we started in, in a barracks area. The barracks area is an area of um, Oak Ridge, um, oh, very near where downtown is now. Just um, it had it had a very poor cafeteria. It had a PX and some low buildings and barracks for things like that. We weren't there very long because. Towards, towards the end of the war, dormitories were being vacant, vacated. And so they sent us to a dormitory out in west, the west end of Oak Ridge where we stayed. And uh, they tried to make soldiers out of us there. We all worked in the plants. And they tried to make soldiers out of us there again, uh, which we resented. Uh, they wanted us to become a marching group for some sort of celebration celebrating the end of the war. And uh, so they had dragged, you know, everybody out of the plants and, uh, on a Thursday afternoon to march up and down the, um, uh, the streets and things like that. This was not, not, not what we liked to do, and we goofed off a lot in doing this. So, I particularly wasn't very, <laughs> uh, wasn't a very good soldier. That was true generally as a SED. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you remember uh, Grove speaking at the end of the Cold War to the collective SED? I, th I think I was there, yes. Yeah, I don't remember anything about it, though. Someone else remembered that he said, now, it was just before Christmas, that he said, write home, don't forget, even if you just put your name on a piece of paper and put it in an envelope, I want you boys to write home. Does that sound familiar? No. I have, uh, you know, there's a lot in, in, in this whole story of the Manhattan Project, there's a lot of business about security. And we shouldn't know anything. I belong to a different group of people, a scientific community. I remember when I first got to Ames, we would have a weekly seminars in which uh, Frank Spedding, who was the head of the Ames Laboratory, would, would tell us what was going on at Site X and Y and <laughs> W, and uh, which were Oak Ridge and uh, uh, Hanford and Los Alamos and things like that. And so we, we, knew, we knew all of the general directions of the project. And so, so we weren't very, uh, the, we were all cleared for this kind of work. We were scientists, so they had expected us to know some of this kind of stuff, even though we weren't, we weren't compartmentalized when I was there. How did that change in Oak Ridge? Um, I went to the uh, Clinton Labs, and it, it changed a little, but not very much. The work we were doing, even when I got there right at the end of the war, was after the Smythe report, it was generally uh, declassified. It was, we had secret notebooks, but all of the kind of work we did was supposedly declassifiable. Uh, we weren't involved in the technology of making weapons like you might have been at Y-12 or the t technology of separating uranium like you might have been doing at uh, K-25. Uh, we were involved with reactors and the chemistry of the heavy elements and things like that. So were you actually at X-10? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Did you, uh, but you weren't there, I mean, the reactor I guess got started up in early as 43, right? No, no, I did not get to, I, 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 did not get to X-10 until somewhere around July 1945, after the war was over. You know, while I was in the Army, I, would, 
I was at the castle on the hill in, in Oak Ridge or at Ames. Leave before you tell us. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> now, any funny stories or kind of uh, ironies or observations about, you know, more about the secrecy or the security or um, living in a town that was gated and guarded? And, and no, it was it, it. It was a lovely, like my wife said, it was a lovely town to live in. We were all guys were all young. I mean, we had we had very you know, it's like when I joined the lab, we had very the very senior per people that were in charge of us were old men of about thirty, and so it was it was basically a youthful group. A uh, few older people, but not not very many, and uh, it was a youthful group, and we. Uh, it was a wonderful place to live. I mean. Uh, so, I mean, looking back, uh, how do you feel about having been part of the Manhattan Project? Oh, I I I delight in it. It. it, uh, it was a you know like so many things it was an accidental almost accidental choice and uh, never regretted it so it was a was it an opportunity that changed the course of your life would you say that oh yes oh yes i mean um, when i was about to graduate i of course i was worried about a job and i wasn't had no idea where I was going to find a, a job in chemistry um, and things like that until I was interviewed by this guy from the Manhattan District or from, from the Met Labs and then I got on the project and uh, I never really, uh, never, never really left it. I guess when the war ended, when I started to work at the lab, it was my intention to uh, quit and go to, go to go to a college to get my PhD, but I kept fiddling around. And we got married, and it was never never got that off the ball. And I took courses. The University of Tennessee had graduate courses in Oak Ridge. Uh, for a long time, and I took courses, and finally got an accumulated enough courses that they said, "Bob, you better do something about this." And so, I started seriously working for my PhD. Mm 